we have fun with animals again, this time in the rainforest. Um, and we had to be speaking about that. Okay, um, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for having me along. Um, this is the Sabangau rainforest on the southern part of the uh, Indonesian section of the island of Borneo in Southeast Asia. And this is where I spent the last year of my life. And I just want to start by telling you a story, um, which is, if you can, can imagine me slightly shorter than I am today, as a seven-year-old boy, um, I had a lesson at primary school about the rainforests, and about all the animals that live there. And I was absolutely thrilled, and I went home that evening and uh, told my parents who kind of helped me as best they could, and we ended up writing off lots of letters to Greenpeace and WWF and Friends of the Earth. And uh, they sent me back to loads of posters and loads of leaflets, and it was all about deforestation, the illegal trading, you know, ivory, um, climate change, overfishing. And, you know, for a few weeks it was quite depressing. I was like, Blimey, the world's, the world's a pretty bad place, particularly as a seven-year-old. Obviously, I've been processing it in quite a sophisticated way as that. Um, but uh, when I was out in Indonesia, it brought me on to thinking about this. So, this is a quote from an article on Fast Company, which is an excellent website magazine that I would recommend if you don't, uh, if you don't already read it. And it said, uh, this was the headline of one of their stories, Watch the state of world deforestation in never-before-seen detail, trees, now you see them, and now you don't, in sobering gifts. And for me, this was around December or so last year, that just rammed home the kind of odd juxtaposition between technology, which sort of talks in such cheery terms about terrible problems in the world. And, you know, um, for me it was just a quite strange juxtaposition. It's great work, it's fantastic work that's been done by Google, actually, and that's the, um, that's the map of Indonesia and the deforestation that's happening there. Um, Indonesia has actually, in the past couple of years, there was a study brought out by the University of Maryland about two weeks ago showing that in 2011-2012, Indonesia actually overtook Brazil as the country with the largest rate of deforestation in the world. Um, and that's largely due to uh, conversion to oil palm, which is in about half of the food that we buy from supermarkets, in most of our cosmetic products, sometimes even in our petrol tanks as well. Um, that's a still from a video about Sumatra. Um, they're doing some quite interesting work in Sumatra, which is also in Indonesia, um, where they're kind of reinventing the use of drones and monitoring illegal logging activity, which takes place in uh, takes place in Sumatra. Mostly, the forest is illegally chopped or burned down to clear the way for palm oil plantations, and that's a legal due to the amount of wildlife that's that's there, and also importantly due to the uh, amount of carbon that's still beneath the soil. And that's a photo from the forest where I worked for a year, the Sabangan Rainforest. Um, and as the world becomes increasingly warmer, uh, particularly during El Nino years, such as this one, there's an increasing risk of forest fires. And we have a community patrol team made up of about 100 people or so from the local village uh, who go out and do key conservation work. And when there are forest fires, one of the very dangerous but important things that they do is they go out and they will fight the fires, putting themselves at great personal risk to protect the rainforest. But for me, we spend far too much time as a conservation movement talking about these problems, talking about these threats. Um, we talk about them an awful lot. I was part of a project about two years ago or so called Common Cause for Nature. Um, which looked at a whole range of literature from across the conservation sector. Campaign materials, communications materials, magazines that you get if you sign up as a member of these NGOs. Um, and it looked at that material across six months from 10 or 20 different conservation NGOs in the UK. And one of the key findings was that talking too much about threats and fear can be unhelpful. It basically makes people feel demotivated um, and, crucially, um, and it's looking at it in a more sort of holistic sense, it found that it can make people feel more materialistic. And the problem with that is that if people feel more materialistic, they go out and they buy more stuff. And that's bad for the natural environment, particularly if the things that they go and buy contain palm oil. So for me, talking too much about threat and fear is undermining ourselves not only in the short term, but also in the long term. So for me, while I was in Indonesia, I was kind of thinking about these things and processing them quite a lot. And I was thinking, um, I was thinking back to this report, and another, another of its key findings was that 
The conservation movement, surprisingly, only very rarely talks about the kind of wonder of nature. That's far less common than talking about the threat and the fear and the loss. So I decided that I wanted to do something that spoke much more about this kind of thing. This is a small clawed oriental otter. There are two of these. They visited our rainforest camp for a couple of weeks. Um, they're one of the many amazing species that you find in the rainforest. This is a southern Bornean gibbon. Um, the Sabanga rainforest where I worked is home to the world's largest population of southern Bornean gibbons. They're classified as endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, this is what they sound like. incredible wildlife rather than the threats to it. Um, I think we need to 
as a conservation movement, we need to couple the threats to the, the threats to the rainforest and the threats to nature far more with the wonder and amazement of it and the reasons that we should all be working to protect it. So I came up with this idea, Rainforest Live, which we ran for the first time in 2014 uh, on the 2nd of June. Um, my organisation, the Orangutan Peatland Project, um, which is the left handmost logo for you there. Um, we worked in collaboration with 10 other organisations from across Southeast Asia, from across Indonesia actually. They all came on board, they all thought this was a fantastic idea. And we did something very, very simple really. Um, we used the hashtag Rainforest Live to share live wildlife sightings from our rainforest sites for the course of a single day. Uh, we used the hashtag on Facebook, on Twitter, and then uh, we took all the tweets and all the Facebook posts and turn them into a story of my story. Um, so I was sat in town behind a, behind a computer. We have a town house which is about 45 minutes or so from our rainforest camp. Um, while our team was out in the rainforest texting me on our, um, on our reliable Nokia phones, which never died no matter how many times you dropped them in the swamp, um, all the sightings that they were seeing live in the rainforest. Um, so this is Amanda and Aziz. Uh, Amanda is a PhD student from the University of Utah. She's from Utah. Um, she makes sure you know that she's from Utah. Um, she's actually specifically working on um, the long haul of the male orangutan, which, uh, which I was hoping to play you. Um, and this is the kind of thing that they were doing for me during the day on Rainforest Live Day. All of our team were out in the rainforest collecting sightings of butterflies, birds, insects, uh, reptiles, amphibians, primates, crucially, and sending them back to me. And what I did over the course of the day, and what the other organisations who were involved did, was sort of start the day with, uh, with saying, so and so and so and so are going off into the rainforest and let's see what they see. And then over the course of the day, you follow the different stories of different groups of people. Um, so rather than just having a random collection of sightings, people could follow the different characters throughout the course of the day and find out, find out what they were seeing. Um, and if you haven't seen Storify before, that's basically how it works. It's a chronological um, list. You can pull in tweets, you can pull in Flickr photos, you can pull in Facebook posts, um, and rearrange them into the order that you, that you want. And for me, the two kind of crucial elements of this was that it was number one collaborative. So the organisations that took part had never worked together as a group before. I think it's fairly uncommon. It's becoming increasingly common in the UK, but I think in Southeast Asia for conservation organisations, it's fairly uncommon for them to work together in such numbers. Um, and secondly, that it was live. Um, what I wanted to do was give people who weren't in Southeast Asia, perhaps have never even been to a rainforest before, a window into what it's like to spend a day in the rainforest through this kind of continuous flow of sightings. Um, so there were two kind of key outcomes that we achieved. Number one, through my organisation alone, I don't have the overall figure exactly for globally, but for OUShop, I know that our hashtag reached theoretically 120,000 people through, through retweets and shares of Facebook posts. Um, considering there were 10 other organisations involved as well, I'm reasonably confident that we reached at least half a million people, which I think isn't bad for, a, for an event in its first year. Um, but for me, one of the best outcomes was this. We had this post on our Facebook wall uh, towards the end of the day, and someone who, I don't know who she is, she's obviously been to, the, to our site before, perhaps she was a volunteer some years ago, um, but she just said it was like being there again, like spending the day there again. And for me, I achieved what I wanted out of the day. Um, because clearly for her, and for a number of the other people who followed the day, it was like a window into the rainforest and what it's like to be there. So we're planning on running the event again in 2015. Um, all the organizations that took part this year are up for being involved again. Um, I'm hoping to help the Orangutan Tropical Freedom Project expand as well, perhaps to the African continent, perhaps to South America. Um, and we're also hoping to secure the involvement of a media partner, perhaps the BBC, perhaps the Guardian. There was some kind of interest in the BBC about this idea, but it was, um, it was a little bit too short notice. We're also hoping to kind of incorporate more technology next time, so as opposed to just our Nokia phones, the organisation is uh, thinking of investing in GoPros, so we can produce some video in advance of what it's like to kind of walk through the rainforest. Um, 
but really I hope to achieve the same things again, to you know, give people an insight into what it's like to spend a day in the rainforest, and to make sure that we focus at least for one day in the calendar year on all the positive reasons why we should protect these special places. So that's my details. If you want to get in touch with me and find out more, then that's the details of the organisation I worked for and that gave me the fantastic opportunity to be out there, the Iran Central Torpedo Project. Thanks. Repeat what? Uh, whatever they ask you, just repeat the question back. Sure. Sorry. Hi, so I'm not really sure it's a question, but I have kind of a comment. So I'm glad you mentioned balance in there somewhere, the positive and negative message, because something that really gets me going is the BBC the flagship nature programme, which goes to the rainforest, they do the oceans, they do the blue planet, that kind of all those things. And they do talk about the wonder a lot. And, but they never talk about the threats. So you have an hour program, it's a captive audience, and they get very upset, so they get a it dies, it's never dies of some shooting, it, it dies of starvation, or something which is maybe climate related, but something that's probably quite natural. And people are crying, saying how upset it is. And, but there's a great opportunity there for people to discuss all well, these are people dying of active demand, but I agree, or in the rainforest, different threats. So my question is, do you have that aspect of balance? Yes, the positive message is there, but are you seeking to remind people when you're doing it that it's under the Okay, so the gentleman was asking, we're saying that you know, nature documentaries by the BBC, for example, are very good at focusing on the wonder, but perhaps leave out the conservation message. And when we did Rainforest Live, did we, yes, focus on the positive message, but also include kind of the conservation one? And my answer would be uh, yes to both. I think that, um, in nature documentaries, it's kind of the reverse situation. I completely agree that very often there's loads of wonder and loads of marvel, um, but there's not very much focus on um, on the kind of loss message or the conservation message or what people can do about it. I don't think the balance is right there. But equally, um, as I said, I think the balance is also right in the conservation sector, and it's skewed too much the other way. But our organisation, at least, and yes, some of the other organisations that took part in Rainforest Live. Um, definitely used um, <coughs> used the day and used some of their tweets and Facebook posts as a way in to talk about the conservation work that we, we had done as an organisation. So it wasn't left out entirely. I just think it's important that um, you know you give people a positive reason to engage with those kinds of messages before you kind of hit them with too much heavy stuff, basically. Yeah. Uh, yes. I know it's been really something listing the title of you said crucially private. How important do you think it was to have, to have something? Like an orangutan is your headline species to get engagement from the public? Um, that's a good question. Um, the organisation has just, uh, this was one of the major projects that I ever saw. Sorry, the gentleman asked whether how crucial it is to have an orangutan as our headline species. Um, the organisation has just completely redesigned its logo um, and has moved away from having an orangutan to having kind of um, lots of, it's a circle with a tree in the middle and lots of silhouettes of all sorts of animals around it. I think um, this is an interesting question. I think that uh, charismatic species such as the orangutan, such as the panda with WWF, and I know it's quite a controversial one for lots of reasons, um, it comes in for some flat from some places, um, are a useful tool. I think it's dangerous to overuse them, um, basically. I think it's important to make sure that there's an understanding there that uh, Every animal in the rainforest is not only important um, in its own right, but also that lots of them play critical functions. Um, fungi, for example, are largely overlooked. They're not very interesting or beautiful, uh, but they play critical functions. Ants are the same. Um, but I think the orangutan is a useful kind of ambassador, if you like, for rainforests. And I don't think we should um, completely do away with its value as that kind of key ambassador role as an animal. Just in response to that, I mean, an environment that can support an orangutan or a tiger, then there's a ripple effect to every other species that lives within the home range and sustains the population of that So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to leave the environment. Yeah, that's right. So, the orangutans, for example, one of our PhD students is doing research on uh, how orangutan food is crucial for fertilizing the forest and how these top level animals, even if they're not necessarily predators, even if they're herbivores like the orangutan, are critical for the health of the forest. 
and even though the forest itself is critical for them, they play a crucial role in making sure that the forest is still there. Um, so Rich is absolutely right that you know, um, even if you focus only on one species, the conservation outcomes can be can be far far wider. Yeah. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how um, the rainforest life then uh, translated into well, an even measurable? I mean, were you were you using any metrics inside your own organisation or across them to see like urban uptake in donations or people signing up for campaigns or anything like that? Were there too many organisations to really have a shared number or shared metric you could use? Yeah, um, I mean, A, there are too many organisations, B, um, B <laughs> the communications kind of uh, side of a lot of these organisations, including the one that I was working for, is probably uh, is far too rudimentary to achieve that kind of thing. Um, I was using kind of free, quite simple uh, social media tracking and an analysis services to keep an eye on the kind of changes in our social media. Our retweet reach that week was astronomic compared to all the other weeks of the year, um, and the best that I could do was, you know, observe that for our own organisation. But um, yeah, a lot of these organisations are very, very small. Um, for me, I'm the I was the only comms person for that organisation. Often, comms is just one part of one other person's job. What I would like to help all these organisations achieve next year and put in place ahead of time is far better social media monitoring. Um, and because I'm not working for them anymore, but I will only work on that project, I'm hoping that I will have the time to put something much, much more robust in place that can track the whole event, basically. Uh, yeah, I'm curious to know from your experience, what's, what's the one thing we can do to protect these world spaces? <laughs> one thing we can do? Okay. Um, so for me, it's usually quite saddening because the usual response to your question would be, don't buy products with palm oil in. I actually find it quite sad that we think of ourselves as consumers first. I think that's part of the problem, but that's a very good conversation and I'd be willing to go into that in more detail than in the interval, I won't go into it here. Um, I don't know if I have one thing that I would say, I would say talk to people about it, and if you're confident doing this kind of thing, talk to or at least write to your MP or your MEP about these issues and find other people who care about it as well. Um, I think that social and political change are um, far more important, far more sustainable long-term changes that can help secure the future of rainforests like Sabangau than you know, changing what you buy at your local supermarket. That's a very big conversation that I'd be happy to have um, in the interval, as I say. So one, one more question? Yeah, you time for one more. Yeah. I just know because you were saying earlier that you had to take the concept of rainforest and rainforest in other parts of the world. Then has the issue of uh, indigenous peoples in the rainforest part? How do you handle that in rainforest part? If you don't want to turn into human zoo, but if you don't want to just find they don't they don't live down at all, they're all like animals and birds and no no one human living there. So how would you use yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, that's not an issue that we encountered in Southeast Asia. I think it's it's not an area which I'm an expert in. I think it would certainly be an interesting one to come across um, if we uh, if we expanded the project to the African continent or to countries in South America. Um, I think you know. Uh, I think if we had to cross that bridge. I think it would be important to consider the way that that message came across, and you know, consider them having a voice as well in the kind of messages that were coming out, but it's not, it's not something that we encountered, but it's a, it would be a very interesting one to grapple with if it came up. Cool, thank you everyone. So we're now going to take 10-15 minute break, so feel free to go get some more drinks and mingle and ask.